and for those social media fans amongst us, if you wish to tweet during the event this morning, use hashtag leadership talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Mary. Ladies and gentlemen, we give a big welcome please, to Sir John Parker. <laughs> welcome, Sir John. How often do you get the chance to uh, return home nowadays? Well, not as frequently as I would like, quite honestly, but uh, I had the privilege of coming here yesterday. I spent uh, a very, very uh, informative afternoon in Bombardier at their new uh, composite wing factory which interests me a great deal because I'm on the board of Airbus and uh, I almost said short. Bombardier are uh, one of our key suppliers. Um, but secondly, it was fantastic to see that investment on the ground, which is absolutely state of the art. Um, and uh, it's an absolute potential leadership uh, wing factory in composite design in the world. And then I went to give the Professor Sir Bernard Crossley Memorial Lecture last night at Queen's. Uh, Bernard was a great friend of mine <coughs> and indeed uh, an inspirational figure in the province and, and outside it. And so it was a great pleasure to come back. And As a sort of brief general overview, just for the moment, what, what are your impressions of Northern Ireland at the moment? Are we progressing as well as we could, as well as we should? Well, I think it's always very difficult to have a view from the outside without being inside. But I think if, you, if I went back to when I came back here in 1983, uh, I think it was, when the bombs were going off and the bullets were flying, uh, and you said to me in 20, 30 years' time, we will have peace and stability, I think even I, who am an optimist, might well have been sceptical. So I think the province, in terms of peace and stability, has made huge strides. Um, I think the big challenge remains to rebuild the private sector and reduce public sector activity. And that's the challenge in many other parts of the UK. And uh, one of the uh, real important things, I think, in, that is happening in the UK that I happen to be president of the Royal Academy of Engineering right now for the last three years and one of the things we've tried to convince government to do and I'm very glad to say they've accepted now is the absolute critical need uh, as North Sea oil declines uh, as the financial services sector will not grow at the predicted rate it might have done a decade ago and by the way we still need a sound financial sector but it's got to be a disciplined one uh, and if you take those two factors uh, there is a big vacuum that has to be filled with other economic activity. And one of the things we've convinced the government to do is to adopt a modern industrial strategy across a range of sectors, aerospace, auto, agri-tech, etc. And uh, I was amazed. I went into the Department of Business the other evening, and they had these posters on the wall to say the whole of government is behind a modern industrial strategy, and they had aerospace, illustrated, auto industry, etc. And the amazing thing in parts of the UK is that you take the auto industry, it was absolutely moribund uh, 15 to 20 years ago. And now it's, we are producing more cars <coughs> than we've ever done in our history, and we're producing 9 out of 10 for export. Yeah. And that's the transformation that's needed. And, you know, I think back to the history of Northern Ireland. In the early 1820s, we were chatting before dinner. You know, this city, it wasn't a city, it was a village of 20,000 people in the early part of the, around 1820. And by the end of that century, <coughs> the largest thread works in the world was established, the largest rope works, and the largest shipyard. It came from that tiny population. So inherent in the people in this part of the world is an entrepreneurial spirit. And it's that entrepreneurial spirit working with government, working with our universities, and it's that triangulation that we've tried to push through the industrial strategy in the UK that is so critically important. How, how are we viewed internationally? Because you're a man who, who travels the world. And when you hear things that we've heard this week with the First Minister threatening to resign, 
with uh, yesterday's news that the Ulster Bank lost one and a half billion pounds last year. That must send shockwaves and warning signs throughout the international business community, surely. Well, I think shockwaves happen in every community, and uh, I don't think you would say that uh, England and Scotland have been free from shockwaves in the financial crisis. I had a, the only time, the only time in my career I've ever joined anything that didn't have engineering running in its bloodstream in terms of companies was when I took on the chairmanship of the Court of the Bank of England for five years to the summer of '09 during the financial crisis. I had a cockpit seat on how the financial crisis unraveled in the country. And talk about shockwaves. I recall well the day that RBS couldn't get through the day because they didn't have the cash. And we were stuffing cash into them like fury uh, in order to save the day. So, you know, there are shockwaves. And there'll always be shockwaves in communities around the world, in every country. But there's a recovery time, and we shouldn't dwell on that. We should get on and create tomorrow. And are we recovering? In the UK, I think that the, it's still fragile. It's still fragile. But there are a number of areas that are doing particularly well. Aerospace is very strong. Uh, the auto industry is very strong. Pharmaceuticals is still strong and growing. So there, there, are, there are a number of sectors that are actually doing very well and starting to drive a rebalancing of the economy. And it's that rebalancing. If we can get that right in the next decade, that'll be good. The problem with politicians, and there are many problems with politicians, it's easy to criticize them. But one of the things that I feel is so critical is that when you establish something like an industrial strategy, it has to cross governments. So if there's changes in governments, there should be some consistency across the boundaries. And the same here. In my view, I don't care what party you are. I've never been a member of a party. But what's critical, and I think what's critical in this province is, whatever the shades of opinion in political terms, they should be absolutely united in developing a proper industrial strategy for this part of the, the island leveraging off the intellectual horsepower, particularly in our universities. That is absolutely critical, from the business school to engineering. And that applied alongside entrepreneurs will bring growth, ultimately bring growth. And you, the people who are the leaders in this province, are the guys who can help bring that about alongside the academics. Uh, and if government can get, can get properly aligned with that. We'll obviously go into this area a little bit later in the discussion, but at this stage, Sir John, I think I would like to find out just a little bit more about you. You're a bit of a mystery man to, to many of us. Uh, you were born in Northern Ireland, your family, you were born into a, a, a farming family uh, outside Newcastle. Tell us a little bit about that family. Well, <laughs> I, I, um, I don't really like talking about myself, quite honestly. Uh, I prefer deeds, not words, like the suffragettes. And uh, I'd rather my deed spoke for who I am rather than talk about myself. But yes, I was born on a farm, and with the hard work, <coughs> the hard work I had to do there, I certainly made up my mind quite quickly that I preferred mathematics and science to uh, the hard work on a farm. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so the the um, but I had a remarkable time there. We lived in the valley of Sleeve and a Man outside Newcastle. And uh, <clears throat> I had the good fortune to go to a small primary school which had uh, 13 or 14 pupils until I was about the age of nine. And we had a, an American school teacher, which was very unusual. And she actually traveled the world during her summer holidays and would come back with black and white cine films of staying in New York or other U uh, US cities. And of course, <coughs> for us to see this was a long before television, was uh, a remarkable um, insight into what was outside um, County Down. So I was very fortunate. I almost had one-to-one -one tuition, actually, until I was nine years of age. Was it never expected of you to be a farmer? I don't think so. I think my, my family. Um, they were very supportive of me um, studying. They were very supportive of me having a good education. 
And uh, I never was forced to take on the family farm. It had been in the farm, for, the farm had been in the family for several generations, yeah. but I escaped. And are, are you an only, were you an only child? No, I had a sister, uh, uh, just the two of us, and um, it was a lovely place to grow up. You then, at 16, you joined Horn and Wolfuz, you got an apprenticeship there. Uh, you went to Queen's University as well to, to, to study naval architecture. Why naval architecture? What, what gave you that idea? Well, I always wanted to be an engineer, actually. And uh, I had this great opportunity to... Harlan's at that time took in about 30 to 40 student apprentices each year. And uh, it was an amazing experience, actually, because you competed for this exam, so three or four hundred kids competed for this, and lucky enough, I, I came out of it. Actually, Professor Don McCloy, who was at the lecture last night, was one of my lecturers. And uh, he, I first went to the College of Technology, where famous D.H. Alexander, a, a wonderful engineer, um, which was a scholar, in fact, uh, was the principal. And he took a great interest in me, supported me, and made me. But Don McCloy was a lecturer, and he actually gave me my exam results, private papers he got from D.H. Alexander a few weeks ago, <laughs> which was quite interesting. Um, so the, it was, I had a fantastic training because not only did I get practical training out in the shipyard, seeing how th ships were built, how engines were built, how electrical switchgear was built, but I also had modular training through all the uh, drawing offices. And um, so by the time, uh, and then, so then also we combined with Queens. Uh, we part-time studied three nights a week as well as day release for, I think, three years, then a full-time year, then another year when we did, uh, in fact, I think I did six years in total. Um, and, uh, but it was amazing practical experience alongside academic work. And I didn't realize how well I was trained until I left here, pardon me. And at about the age of 32, I took on my first managing director job in Sunderland. Well, which, uh, you were only 32. You yeah. were asked to go as, as managing director of uh, Austin and Pickersgill Austin, and yeah. so on. Yeah. And had a workforce of something like 3,000 people. You were only 32. People must have had supreme confidence in you, and indeed you must have had supreme confidence mm -hmm. in yourself to take on such a role. Well, I suppose it's a stage in your life where you're pretty naive. Uh, and uh, and uh, other people are taking the risk. Uh, and it so happened the new chairman that had gone into Austin and Pickersfield, he had been production director here in Belfast, and I did a lot of work for him, uh, including, as I was talking last night, Bernard Crossland, who was a great engineer, was ex always extremely interested in big engineering projects. And one of the biggest things that I was involved in as a young naval architect and engineer was the launching of the, a, a rig, a se a first semi-submersible drilling rig that went into the North Sea for BP. And uh, it was so vast, this is before building docks, it had to span three slipways. It was triangular shaped with big elephant feet, and each elephant foot sat on three separate slipways. It was a massive massive structure. And the Japanese yards refused to tender for the contract because they said, you cannot launch such a structure from three slipways. It's impossible. So meantime, Harlan's at that time had a very risk-taking managing director in Alan Watt. And he took the contract and then came to the design office and said, you fellas figure out how you're going to launch that. <laughs> so I had a wonderful experience. <coughs> and on the day it launched, uh, we had, a, had to put a temporary barge in the middle slipway on the middle foot so that when the rig went, the two elephant feet went over those two slipways, this barge picked up the buoyancy to keep it from tipping. But the, lo the tide wasn't as high as it should have been on that day, so the loads transferred to the barge were even higher than we calculated. Remember, this is the days before computers. Uh, we had a, I think we had a wind-up calculating machine, but it was mainly slide rope. And... Uh, so to get this structure in, so as it's going in, this barge buckled quite visibly, as did my knees, uh, and, uh, but the rig was safely launched. And uh, 
no damage to her whatsoever. But however, the press, and I'm sure, there's, are there any members of the press here? Uh, they were doing a great job that morning. They rushed around my boss, Dr. Cameron, the chief technical director, and said, Dr. Cameron, there's clearly been a disaster. What have you to say about it? And he said, the barge was designed to be, gen the, bar the barge gentleman was designed to be expendable. <laughs> I learned a lot about <laughs> dealing with the press on that particular incident. Yeah. Well, you had to deal with the press uh, on numerous occasions when you come back to Belfast, because obviously your name had been growing within in the industry, because in, in 1983, Margaret Thatcher's government asked you to come back to head up uh, Harland and Wolf. Uh, what was your reaction to that request? Well, I, I was uh, doing a much bigger job. I was British shipbuilders. I actually was the deputy chief executive. We had 80,000 employees. Um, but I have to tell you that uh, I got hijacked out of Austin and Pickerskill after four, four or five years because the Labour government, the Callaghan government in its dying days, uh, I sound like a history master here, <laughs> don't I? The Callaghan government in its dying days um, decided to nationalise the industry. And it actually got through. The bill had a very torturous route through to privatise, sorry, to nationalise both the aircraft industry and the shipbuilding industry on the same day. And uh, had a very torturous route through Parliament. It got through by one MP from Fermanagh that had never visited the House before. This is the story. And he went into the wrong lobby. And by one vote, this bill got through. And suddenly, uh, this new corporation is born under Tony Benn to start with. And uh, on the 1st of July, 1977, I was hijacked out of A&P to go for two days a week to help them set up a national marketing operation. And then I just got sucked in more and more. But I have to tell you about my naive again. Um, I had never dealt with government. I'd never. Uh, dealt with civil service or a, a, a minister, and suddenly in a nationalised industry, you're confronted with it, absolutely confronted with it. And the first meeting I went to in Whitehall, um, there was a famous Polish shipbuilding deal to set the British government wanted done to sell 24 ships to the Polish national shipping line. And it had been started, but uh, I'm suddenly handed this, and they said there's going to be a meeting round in DTI in those days. I went round. There was 25 people on the other side of the table, and I'm on my I'm on my own with a young clerical officer from the corporation. And uh, my, you grow up quickly. And uh, but very stretching experiences. And I wouldn't have I wouldn't have missed that five year period, although it was a dreadful time dealing with government and nationalised industry, but my goodness, you learned a lot. Why did you accept the job with Ireland and Wolf? Well... Because you were coming to Belfast at a, at a terrible time in our, in our history. In the middle of the you were, you were a married man with children yep. at that stage, and it did mean you leaving a big job to come mm -hmm. to here. Why did you accept it? Well, <laughs> it was pretty agonising, and I, I can only tell the story now that um, I s said to the government at the time, I don't really want to do the job, I prefer to stay where I am, but if if it's a must and you think I can add some value, and maybe because the yard with 8,000 people was going down the Swanee, so order books were shot, um, and uh, the climate to bring work into Northern Ireland with bombs going off on television every night around the world was very, very challenging. So um, we had to find... Anyhow, I accepted, for better or for worse, and, uh, but I only signed up for three years. I said, I'm not going to stay a day longer than three years. I want to go back again and resume my career. Well, I ended up staying 10. Uh, and I remember when I <laughs> left to go to join Babcock International after 10 years, uh, a TV interviewer said to me, uh, did you jump or were you pushed? And I never could tell the story that I only signed up for three years and stayed 10. However, uh, that was all our yesterdays. But you, you came at a time when, as you say, the race thousand people working, the, the Harden and Wolf were losing something like £45 million yeah. pounds a year. Uh, there were troubles at your doorstep. You had unions to contend with. You had, yeah. you had members of parliament and, and local politicians knocking at your door. How did you build a survival plan for Harden and Wolf? What, what was the ethos of it all? Well, you know what? I've learned, in t I've done a few turnarounds now 
And the first thing that I do, and I would do it much faster now than I, I did it then, but eventually you do get around to it. The first place you start in a turnaround is with the non-executive directors in your boardroom. That sounds strange. But the reality is non-executive directors have the privilege of being in somebody else's boardroom, and they're either an audience watching decline, or they're people who are intervening and challenging management to get the company back on its feet again. So I always start with the non-executive directors. I'm not necessarily proud of it, but at Anglo-American, I'm there four years now, and I've changed every single non-executive director. Every one of them have gone. And there were one or two exceptionally good people in that who are now leaving at the end of their term. I'd have loved to kept them on, but they have outlived their uh, nine-year uh, governance rule. So that's important to start there, and then you tackle the management. Uh, because non-executives and a non-executive chairman have a huge responsibility in a boardroom to challenge management and to bring added value into the boardroom. And if they're not doing that uh, and not attempting to rescue decline, then they're spectators. And that, to me, is completely unacceptable. So, um, yeah, I, I could talk a lot about that subject because I've learned a lot in turnarounds. But the next thing is to get good management around you. Get the f I've always tried to hire people much better than myself, always. I've never had any problem of having brighter people around them than I am, uh, which is probably not too difficult. <coughs> and, uh, but to get seasoned leadership in your chief executive is your prime responsibility as a chairman. And then to build a great board with a range of skill sets you don't need six centre forwards and two left backs. You need a range of skill sets and you need uh, a range of experiences. I always say I like to have a team built that can deal with any, any issue that walks through the boardroom door. And that to me is, is very, very critical. You also needed though to have great PR skills because you had to deal with the unions at the time. You had to deal with the local MPs. What was your relationship with the local MPs at the time? Because they were at the gates demanding the, the workforce out on every other day. Absolutely. Well, you just deal with them because you tell them it's not on. And, you know, I find that... Um, did you or did you not lock a couple of MPs in your boardroom at Harland and Wolf? <laughs> uh, we, we, uh, we did you or did you not lock... <laughs> did you lock... <laughs> We didn't rehearse this, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, the, I do remember the very first Did Christmas you lock I two? <laughs> I'll get round to it. Uh, uh, so I do remember the first Christmas I came here. A shop steward asked to see me. It was Christmas Eve. And I knew all these shop stewards by then, by name. Because, by the way, the one thing about leadership I've learned, communication is the sister of leadership and integrity is an integral part of how of the unions you deserve. And management get the unions they deserve at the end of the day. And uh, once you start communicating with them and they trust you, <coughs> and above all, respect you, they don't have to like you, they have to respect you. And by the way, I think it's terribly important uh, for young guys growing up in management to learn that to be liked is not the most important thing, but to be respected is a key thing. And um, so I remember this for, this guy came to see me, uh, the leather welding jacket on and the rest of it. And he said, I've just, I said, what, what can I do for you? He said, I, I've just come to tell you, Dr. Paisley will be coming in to address the workforce on the 3rd or 4th of January when we get back. I said, that's interesting. Why is he coming down? Oh, it's the election time. He said, uh, I said, well, he's, this is not his constituency. Upper Ban, I think, is North Antrim. So um, he, he said, oh, well, that doesn't matter. It's custom and practice. He's always done this at election time. I said, what time of the day is he doing it? He's, he's coming in at our tea break at 10 o'clock. I, and I said, how long is this going to last? He said, oh, probably half an hour. So it'll be three quarters of an hour or more, and probably an hour out of your working day, won't it? Yeah, probably, he said. So I said, who's paying you? Because I won't be. Is he? So I said, it's not on. He said, if it wants to electioneer, do it outside the gates. We're fighting for survival. He said, I don't believe what I'm hearing here. 
He said, you're trying to break custom and practice. I said, I'm trying to ensure a future for you and your mates. So you tell Dr. Paisley, and uh, if he's got a problem with it, my door's open. I'm very happy to discuss it with him. But I never heard another word about it. I saw Big Ian on the plane about the 8th or 9th of January going to Westminster. He said, morning, John. I hope you're getting on well and running that shipyard of ours. I said, with your help, I will, Ian. <laughs> and I actually had a very good relationship with him after that. Did you look to him? To <laughs> It's absolutely true. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, no, it was the time of the Anglo-Irish Agreement, and we were fighting for a huge contract uh, for a big naval vessel, because the strategy we adopted was a three-legged stool. My father always told me that a three-legged stool <coughs> is stable on any rough ground. So I thought that might not be a bad idea. So what? The merchant shipbuilding market was going down like a stone, so we, I knew we had the great in-depth technical skills, so we went into offshore work uh, and did some very sophisticated things for the North Sea, and we went back into naval building again, which we'd been out of for years, and just kept a toe on the merchant shipbuilding market. And that saved the yard, and we got it back, just nosed into profit from 45 million into profit in the year three to four, and then Mrs. Thatcher said, privatize. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, which is really what kept me here, because I'd built a team, and I couldn't let them down, and I could see some very uh, smart Turkish ship owner or something turning up and find getting this thing for nothing, mm -hmm. uh, except for, and in no time flat it'd be closed. So anyhow, and that's when I managed to negotiate and bring Fred Olsen of Norway in, who's still there, although it's a shadow of his former self. But, um, and I've left there now over 21 years. Did, so did you, it, leave, did you leave Scar free, Sir John? Scar free? Mm -hmm. I think leaders should value the scars on their back. Seriously. I think every experience is a learning experience. The good ones, the bad ones, the ones you don't want to remember again, they are actually the scars in your back. I remember, um, which job was it? Somebody said to me, um, coming into a turnaround job, that was it was RMC Group, the big, uh, which the world's largest ready-mixed concrete group, which was uh, going down the Swanee, and I'm parachuted in as the chairman. But a couple of the wise non-executives interviewed me. Uh, they weren't necessarily wise to appoint me, but they were wise to interview me, or they were wise during the interview, let me put it like <laughs> that. And uh, they said to me, are you shockproof? I said, I think probably I am. And that's actually an important characteristic if you're going in to a very, very difficult turnaround situation. So you do benefit from the scars on your back. and. Uh, Everything's relative to your worst, your worst situation, and uh, so yes. Was of all that you've done, were those ten years at Harland and Wilf from '83 to '93? Would you describe those as the toughest years of your working life? They were tough. Um, the Anglo-Irish Agreement. I didn't finish that story because it was quite interesting uh, about communication. Uh, we were fighting for this huge naval contract. I involved the shop stewards on every move, and I took them to London to lobby, even though it may not have been any effect. They were involved. <coughs> and Paisley got involved and helped. John Hume got involved and helped. And in fact, John Hume, Paisley, and uh, who was the leader of the Unionist Party at the time? It would have been... Molyneux. 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 All three went to see Mrs. Thatcher. And of course, she'd never got the Northern Ireland guys together like this before in her parlour. And she was shocked. But we managed to manage that. And, um, but we were coming up to the decision just after, and it was going to be made after the Anglo-Irish Agreement was signed. And I'm saying to our guys, for goodness sake, don't you dare walk out. If you do, 
you'll be first on television, the Goliath cranes will be over you, and Mrs. Thatcher will put the sword through the company. I said, this is your livelihood. I remember one night, I was at home, New Year's Eve, I said to my wife, I'm going to the D Street uh, Welders Club. She said, you're what? <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, this is a huge club. I don't know if anybody in this room has ever been in it. I was only in it that once, but I'd heard about it. There must be a thousand people can get in there. There are about ten bars, and you go down this narrow black street, dimly lit, and you knock the door and nothing happens and finally a great bouncer came to the door about quarter to midnight and said, who are you? I said, no, I'm just here to see Geordie Rose who was our senior shop steward. So the door closes and I'm out in the dark in D Street. So I went in and I met him and I said, look, this Anglo-Irish agreement's coming up. I'm really worried that you guys are going to do something daft. So he said, well, come on in. And uh, he said, so he handed me the microphone to address these thousand men and women who are in here. And uh, I told them, frankly, do not listen to the politicians. They don't put any money in your pay packet on a Friday night. They don't really lift their finger all the time they should to help you get more jobs in the province. So in fact, um, I do urge you all, and I must say I got an amazing reception. And when it came to the Anglo-Irish Agreement, they didn't walk out. But on the day that it happened, the, I was at my lunch and the security officer came, he was as white as a tablecloth. I said, what's wrong? He said, well, two MPs, I'll not name them, uh, have got into the yard, they've smuggled themselves in, and they're trying to assemble the workforce for a mass meeting. He said, what do I do? I said, take your Land Rover, go out and convince them I want to see them, urgently. And if they resist, arrest them. So my, well, I had one or two pretty weak-kneed colleagues at the time on the board, and I got rid of them shortly afterwards. But um, he said, oh, you can't do that, you can't do that. You know, you'll have a riot on your hands. I said, are we managing this place or are we not? So. He went back, I said, and when you get them, take them to the boardroom, turn the key and bring me the, bring me the key, which is what happened. That's the answer to your question. <laughs> Has Peter Robinson ever forgiven you? <laughs> we, we all became great friends. <laughs> but the reality is, you know, if you're paid to lead, I have a very black and white view about this. You either are weak need or you have the strength of your convictions. And there's nothing in between. And uh, it's amazing that if you lead, the people will follow you if you've got a clear direction. Is it lead with fairness you're talking about or lead with toughness? No, I, I think you must always lead with fairness. Uh, I think you have to be tough in certain situations, but you've got to be fair. People at the end of the day have to say he was right to do that or she was right to do that. This is in the interest of the company. You must always act in the interest of the majority of your employees, uh, as well as clearly acting in the interest of your shareholders. I'm conscious of time, and I do want to move on a little bit, because after uh, Harlan and Wolf, you, I don't know how many uh, boards you've been either CEO or uh, non-executive directors of, it's over 20 at the moment. What is it about you, Sir John Parker? Why do so many companies find you so irresistible that you they want you on their board? I've never th had that said about me before. <laughs> uh, there was a time when I was a young man, I wouldn't have mind that word being used about me, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I've not, uh, I, I, look, at the end of the day, you, I suppose you're fortunate to make your own reputation um, for fairness, for leadership, for the ability to, to get a team of people together, because you don't do it on your own. I mean, at the end of the day, the critical thing in any company is to hire the best people, get the strongest board, have a very clear strategic direction, and then uh, communicate, communicate, communicate.
communication is the sister of leadership and uh, that's the formula and even the, the evolvement of strategy is I've seen it done so differently in so many companies but the only way in my view that you do it it's the CEO who must formulate strategy it's not the chairman it's the CEO who formulates strategy who brings it to the boardroom that you've assembled with the right skill set to debate it, stress test it, adapt it, change it, modify it, whatever. And when it's parceled up, you then empower the CEO and the management to go out and execute it, and you, the board, hold the CEO accountable for its delivery. That's the only way I know, uh, and I've seen it done in so many different ways. I've, I've, I remember a couple of chairmen I worked with, um, I'm responsible for strategy. I determine where we're going. No, you don't, mate. The board does. And that's so important to get right. If you get that right, you get direction of the company right, and you get alignment across the company. The reason for a good corporate strategy is to get alignment across the various departments, just like in trying to convince the, the government about a, a modern industrial strategy, is to get alignment across government departments to get R&D funding, to get education policy, to get training policy, etc., uh, etc. Et Immigration rules even, uh, aligned <coughs> with what the country wants to do in terms of wealth creation. What criteria do you personally use uh, when you decide whether you will join a board or not? I remember uh, Ian McGregor who was brought in by Mrs. Thatcher to chair British Steel after they had a huge debacle with unions. And Ian McGregor was a really hard American who was born in Scotland. And uh, I joined, he then left British Steel. Well, I knew him at British Steel very well because obviously buying a lot of steel and building ships for them. But uh, he then went to British Coal. Uh, and of course, there was that long strike with Scargill and I went to see him because he asked me if I'd join the coal board, which I did. I was on the British coal board for about nine years. And he said to me something I've never forgotten. He said, John, it's very important, he said, that you choose your company wisely. He said, you should choose the board of your company as if you're choosing your parents. And I never forgot that. I, it, and I'll tell you this, in my experience, yours might be different, you will never, I don't care how much you do talk to the auditors, how much you talk to uh, a range of people, you never know a company until you get inside. Never. Because what you don't know and can't inspect in is the culture of that company halfway down the, you may get a feeling for the boardroom. The best guide is to choose a company where you know the chairman and the CEO are not guys who, instead of going around the corner in four wheels, go around in two, and who are people who believe in good governance and good discipline. That's your best protection, probably. Uh, but you have to choose very carefully. As a CEO of, of many <coughs> companies, how, how good are you at, and how important is it to delegate responsibility and authority? to the team, to the other members of the board and so on? Well, I think once you've agreed the strategy, it's so important you empower the management to go out and execute. And it's your job with the CEO to ensure you've got the right uh, quality of management in those areas where the execution is going to, who, the leaders are going to execute. And um, there's a lovely Chinese proverb, which I think encapsulates leadership and the involvement of the people. It says, when the best leader's work is done, the people said, we did it ourselves. When the best leader's work is done, the people said, we did it ourselves. And if you dissect that, the people must have known where they were going. The leader must have empowered them to go in that direction. He must have been encouraging them. They must have felt the confidence. They must have been motivated. Uh, and he clearly, the leader, could have been a woman or she, had not an ego. Uh, because not seeking credit for himself, for her, the people said, we did it ourselves. And how important that is, 
to make people believe in the journey and get them inspired to go on the journey and give them the authority uh, and the responsibility and those things must always be coterminous almost must be always must be coterminous and uh, that's so critical so when the best leaders work is done the people said we did it ourselves and any advice I could give to the younger generation would be leave your ego at home it'll be far better managed there than in any corporate activity your wife your partner your husband will take much better care of it uh, than you than anybody at work can because we don't need any arrogance walking through the door my father used to say you'll meet people in life who don't know that they don't know how true <laughs> you, you talked about the word respect earlier how, how do you gain respect is it by making money for the company is it by dealing fair with the workforce are there shortcuts to gaining respect no I don't think there's any I don't think there's many shortcuts in life to anything uh, I think that uh, you have to work your passage you have to earn respect um, I think that the, the first ingredient is competency uh, competency in your knowledge of the business what it's about and that frankly is why I've always stuck to companies that have a engineering running through the bloodstream because you can very quickly take command in the boardroom you can very quickly in making visits around the parish talk to the parishioners and understand what's going on and you get a tremendous feed and you talk the language very quickly so um, I think competency uh, you are seen to be on top of uh, your remit uh, you're seen to put that extra effort in to get to know people and above all listen we don't learn too much by always talking so important to listen and it's so important to listen at different levels in the company and I like going out in parish visits uh, I would never give an executive command down the line as a chairman that's the CEO's job. Never would I interfere in that. But I do pick up a lot. And in my one-to-ones with the CEO, I will be able to give him feedback. I met a great executive. I met someone who was totally enthused and top of their job. Do you know them? Have you? Uh, by the way, I'm concerned because I picked up this is happening. You may not be aware. Then it's the CEO's job to fix. All right. Tell us a little bit about your uh, uh, your current position, CEO of Anglo American. Chairman. Chairman, sorry. Yeah. One yeah. of the biggest main. No, they don't. They the don't world. hire me as CEO anymore. <laughs> uh, well, it's you know it's it's a huge company. I think we've got about a hundred and close to one hundred and forty thousand employees uh, all around the world. Uh, we uh, we mine coal in Colombia and Australia and Canada. We mine uh, iron ore in Brazil and uh, South Africa. Uh, we uh, are the world's largest platinum miners in South Africa. Uh, and of course, we're the, the world's largest diamond miners in we own De Beers. Right. And so if the ladies want to see me afterwards for a discount. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, that's a pretty exciting business. Uh, we owned 45% of it until 18 months ago, and we paid $5.1 billion for the other 40% from the Oppenheimer family. So we now are in a majority shareholding position. We mine diamonds in South Africa, but mainly Botswana. Botswana has the best diamonds in the world, uh, and Nam Namibia and Canada. A long way from naval architecture. Yeah, but there's an amazing amount of engineering in there. Amazing amount of engineering. And actually, my time on the coal board, you, you say, well, what did you join the coal board for? Well, it's, it's, it's another experience, another wonderful experience I had there. Nationalized industry, yes. But I learned a very great deal uh, about mining there. Um, but you know the thing that probably I benefited most from in my early days here, during training, was I learned about uh, managing human beings and um, the richness of dealing 
was a workforce and so on. And uh, a lot of that training uh, helped me enormously in my management career. Um, and, uh, but the important thing when you get to CEO type role and your chairman's role, the important thing is you're taking your business on a journey. Uh, you know, the, the, the root of the word leadership actually is a pathway or the, the course of a ship at sea. In other words, it's got a direction to it. Uh, it's got a course set. And um, uh, that, that is very important. Somebody once said, if you as the leader are not taking an organization on a journey, then just settle for management. And that's the difference between strategic leadership and simply dealing with the nuts and bolts each day. Uh, and turning the handle. Yeah. What keeps you awake at night, Sir John? I learned a long time ago, in my very early days in management, I worked out, always get your sleep, because you can't change much in the middle of the night, number one. Number two, you'll not have the energy to deploy tomorrow morning to face the challenges that you're going to meet as a leader. And frankly, it's just a state of mind. And I head hit the pillow six and a half hours minimum sleep. I'm not a Mrs. Thatcher. You're not a Mrs. Thatcher. No. You need no. your six and a half hours. No. Of all that you've done, and, and you're over 70 now, if, if I may say that. What I didn't want that disclosed. Sorry. No. <laughs> it's, it's not live. We'll, we'll take it out anyway today. Yeah. Uh, what gives you your kicks today? What, what, what are your challenges today? I think the, the big challenge you have as a chairman is to build a great board. It's like being the manager of a football team. I did use that analogy earlier in the composition of the board. So I, I, I like building strong boards. I like to be part of strong boards. I'm very fortunate I have three non-executive roles which are all overseas. The board of Airbus in Europe, which is an incredible company, 145,000 employees building five times the number of planes uh, that they built only over a decade ago uh, and uh, building more planes than Boeing. An incredibly successful company where the wings of every Airbus, the most complex engineering part, is designed and built in Britain. People don't realize that. Every Airbus, the wings are built in Broughton in North Wales and designed in Bristol. So um, that's a fantastic company. And on the board of Carnival Cruise Group, and these are all growth companies. Um, Carnival Cruise Group, which 25 years ago started with one old ship, and today has 101 ships with brands like Cunard, p and Cruises, Princess Cruises, Holland America, Yachts of Seabourn, etc. Um, now that's amazing growth, amazing growth. And then uh, I'm on DP World in Dubai, which is the international number three port container work in the world with 60 container ports in all six continents. I think they handled last year 55 million containers around the world and 15 years ago they handled one. So that's growth and that growth is some incredibly bold risk taking um, and above all, great engineering in their ports and great engineering management in their ports to keep that machine running wherever it happens to be. How on earth do you manage your week with all that going on? Well, I sleep a bit. Six and, and a half hours. Uh, yeah. I talk to my wife and uh, I spend a bit of time with my grandchildren, my grandsons, and uh, I have a great interest in many things outside of work. If work stopped tomorrow, I would have many interests, thank God. Really? Yeah. Does the word retirement enter your vocabulary or your thoughts? I've been asked about it once or twice at home. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on it. We're working on it. You're very keen on, on working with young people and you have, a great, uh, you have great thoughts about young people. What would your advice be to young entrepreneurs, young people starting out in the business, in business at, the, at this day? Well, I think Leave the ego at home. I'll, I'll yeah. start with that. That's so important. Uh, and uh, don't, uh, don't um, necessarily confuse a high IQ with 
high interpersonal skills. So make sure that your interpersonal skills uh, are equipped alongside your IQ because emo emotional intelligence is hugely, hugely important if you take on a leadership role. Um, I think the most important thing is to work hard. I have never found a shortcut to that. Secondly, know your st subject, work hard on every uh, project you're given, and always leave things better than you found them. Always leave them better than you found them, whatever job you take on. That's so important. That's how you make your mark. It's how you get noticed in a company. You do that a little bit extra that you're not asked to do, but you do it because you're enthusiastic about the role and you want to do a good job and you want to leave things better than you find them. And that is probably the very basics. Very conscious of the time. Sir John, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please thank Sir John Parker. Thank you. Sort of looking for direction. Could we could we spend five minutes? Do you reckon on uh, anybody with a question would like to ask for John? I have a plane to catch. That's so the only problem. But uh, but I think there's some press that I have to see as well. So we need to. Okay. But I'm not managing the event, so Fergal is. Yeah. Thank you. Um, but if I don't get to the other <laughs> side of. Can you quick Jerry Kaiser's question? Or this is right. <laughs> Sitting on multiple boards simultaneously, do you ever have conflicts that you have to address? And how do you deal with that? You, sh you should always try to never have that situation. And uh, none of the boards I'm on today actually trade with each other in any way. But if it did arise, well, you have to make your position very clear and step out of the room. I have one director on. Anglo, who is conflicted in one commodity, so he always goes out of the room when we're discussing it. Yeah. One last yeah. Well, sorry. There's one more question. That's all we can take. John, we like to say something about the power of the chief executive, bearing in mind the free will and the world like society. Yeah. Well, that's. Uh, <clears throat> I don't want to comment on the on the, on the Fred situation, but I. But the principle should be that the board, as a whole, is in charge. I said earlier you have the chairman who will say I'm in charge of strategy. No, you're not, mate. Uh, but neither is the CEO in a way. He's the guy who brings it up to the board, and the board at the end of the day approve, debate, and own it. And then he's got to execute it. He can't go off and do something entirely different. So the board has to hold him accountable, or her accountable, for the delivery of that strategy. And if that, those disciplines aren't in place, uh, and clearly there are many companies you can point to where there's been failure where that's not been in place, that's a fundamental failure of the chairman and the board. If the, if the chief executive can get away with it, good for him, or bad for him. But it's the board that needs the finger pointed at them. We're going to have to leave the questions there. Sorry. Fergal, would you like to wrap up, please? Uh, Vice Chancellor of the University, Professor Richard Barnett, and Pro Chancellor and Provost of the Belfast Campus. Not just as small as I thought it was, all right, I've been over there. Not too often I have to stand up to be heard. <laughs> um, uh, Pro Vice Chancellor, Provost of FS Campus, Professor Alistair Derr, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, on your behalf and on behalf of FPM, I'd like to express our heartfelt appreciation to Mr. John Parker for what I think we all would agree was his inspiration and leadership and really common sense comments you won't get in books, but you need for life. That was really superb. Thank you very much. It is obvious that Sir John has, uh, why Sir John has been acclaimed as an outstanding president of the Royal Academy of Engineering. It is also very easy to understand why Sir John has been referred to as Britain's very own Clark Kent. 
Uh, most days, <laughs> I thought I'd keep it distant here. Most days, uh, he's the main man and chairman who has run some of the UKs and did some of the world's most strategic corporations. But whenever uh, a really big crisis hits, he is the person who has been sought after to swing into action. So whether it's Britain potentially running out of gas, banks potentially about to collapse, barbarians at the gates of a giant mining company, no problem. Superman Sir John was there, bang in the middle of the crisis, leading the troops on master mining solutions. And thus how honoured we were this morning to, give, to gain an amazing insight into the person and the authentic leadership and values of Sir John. It is very interesting <coughs> that Sir John Parker recalls advice given to him by his father as some of the best advice he ever received. If you can't manage your time, you can't manage anything. And one we heard again today, if you're on rough ground, get a three-legged stool. <laughs> so I believe, and I'm sure you believe, that in any history of Northern Ireland's distinguished business entrepreneurs and leaders, the name of Sir John Parker, GBE, will always be prominent. I'm confident that Sir John's leadership entrepreneurial experience, vision and views which you shared with us today will provide a stimulus for further innovation, engineering and design and ultimately lead to significant economic and social capital growth. It takes two to chat and I'm sure you'll all agree that Jerry Kelly once again gave a power yeah, yeah. yeah. uh, thank you. All of Jerry Kelly's experience of regularly topping viewing meetings but we may think it's a history after careful here. Kelly show for 17 years and now gracing us on the BBC airwaves was obviously clearly demonstrated today. And listening and observing to Sir John, I am very conscious that, that authentic leadership and good management makes a difference. And that one should never get so high up that you can't find time to go down. I like this way he talked to he called the parishioners. We at FPM Charter Accountants believe that the FPM brand is associated with a desire to serve and to care, to deliver service excellence. We believe that our motivation in life and indeed in business as trusted business advisors should be to help others to win and achieve their dreams and quality of life aspirations. And from the outset, we sought to attract, develop and reward the very best talent to ensure our business and our clients future success. Our value proposition is therefore to utilize our international links throughout the world to deliver results and positive change through design, believe it or not, even in accountancy, design, creativity, and innovation of the differentiators in terms of impact solution for existing and potential clients. In that context, I'm delighted to confirm this morning that we are just about to expand our Belfast operations, staying in the same address but moving to double sized floor. And also, one of my colleagues, fortunately, a lot younger than myself, Judith Shields is here today, has just been elected the first female chairperson, I think, outside Dublin or Belfast of the Charter Accountant Student Society. Mm, so welcome. Yeah, yeah. Well done. We were delighted and indeed honoured to host this event this morning in association with our fellow Management Leadership Network Champion Organisation, Milster Business School, at the University of Ulster as part of the MLN Management Leadership Month. The Ulster Business School here at the University of Ulster has established itself as the province's premier business school and has rapidly gained prestige, international recognition and credibility under the leadership of its charisma, charismatic dean, Professor Mary McHugh. And indeed, congratulations are due to Mary on becoming the first recipient in Northern Ireland of a fellowship from the British Academy of Management, one of the most internationally recognised and respected management academies. God, Mary, I don't know how it was. Mary, I hope you're on your knee every time we meet you now. <laughs> it was a great privilege to, uh, to work closely with Professor McHugh in the organisation of today's event, and I can publicly thank her for all our guidance and support, and through her, the Vice Chancellor, Richard Warner, and his team. <laughs> I'd also like to thank and congratulate our fellow uh, management leadership network champion organisations, uh, led by Bill Manson, and indeed, I'm also conscious that today is the last day of Management Month and it has been a tremendous month for the Management Leadership Network. You will appreciate that events like today just don't happen 
I'd like to express our sincere thanks also in terms of administration here at the University to Mary Doyle and Nick Reid and the facilities team. In terms of ICT and audio, we thank Paul and his team. We also like to acknowledge the support of Jane Wells from uh, JPRNI. I'd like to thank Simon Mooney and Minnie Mooney for all their assistance in terms of design, our own Darren McCoy, and indeed not forgetting Kevin Boys and photographers. Finally, I hope you will all agree that we were very fortunate to be entertained by beautiful music at the registration reception downstairs by the Arco uh, String Quartet, and we thank them uh, for their beautiful music. I am conscious that as I get up each morning, how fortunate and indeed honoured I am to lead a positive and energetic, perhaps passionate, Team FPM. And once again, I'd like to thank all my colleagues for their tremendous support in the organisation of the FPM Leadership Talk. I thought I should really now cog Sir John and refer to the old Japanese proverb, a slightly different one, none of us are as smart as all of us. And certainly that's the culture we, we aspire to within FPM. In terms of thanks, I'd like to finally thank you for coming along in such great numbers and ensuring once again a full house. Uh, and just before concluding, it's extremely hard to buy, to think of an appropriate gift for someone like Sir John Parker. But once again, uh, we have gone to Dublin artist Brent oh Pierce to create a caricature. Share this with you because actually you got to remember we didn't know what Sir John was going to say. Believe it or not, uh, on the back two paintings hanging up on the wall is two quotes from Sir John's father. If you're on a rough ground, get a three-legged stool. <laughs> and believe it or not, here is the three-legged stool. <laughs> We also have the Airbus coming in over the Harlem Wolf Brains, and believe it or not, we have a couple of nice quotes in the papers. And one said, Elder Statesman Parker takes over as president of the Royal Academy of Engineering with a youth policy to boost industry's future. Sir John, thank you very much. Indeed. Many thanks. Well, thank you all very much indeed. I've enjoyed being back here amongst my own folk. Thank you very much.